So just be aware you are being recorded um, and probably I will post this recording um, on our website so you can go back and refer to it later or um, you or others can refer to it and hear the, the wisdom of your ideas and questions. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, it is 12.03, so um, I'm going to get us started. Um, my name is Cynthia Brame. Um, I'm an Associate Director at the Center for Teaching, and we're having this uh, session because Tom Palmieri suggested it a couple of weeks ago. He was in a workshop with me that was sort of on, it was an introduction to online and hybrid teaching. And he said, you know, this is great, but teaching coding is its own animal. And it would be really helpful um, to talk about teaching coding with some people who do that. And so that was the genesis of this um, workshop. Uh, it's th this discussion. Uh, not precisely a workshop. And so what we're going to do um, is we've got three guests, so Jerry Roth, Jules White, and Doug Schmidt, all of whom have a lot of experience um, with teaching coding, um, both online and face-to-face. -face. And they're going to share some of their observations, their experiences, their advice um, for five to seven minutes each. Um, this is may be very informal, right? I didn't ask them to prepare a big presentation. Um, so they're gonna share those observations and advice. Um, and then we'll just open this up for, for free discussion. Um, before we get started, um, I'm going to ask you all to consider renaming yourself. Um, basically so for two reasons. One, I wanna make sure everybody knows how to do that. And the other is I want to point out that this is a good practice to engage in when you're working with your students. So you've got a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, if you're on a PC, um, you can hover over your video screen and then right click on your name, and which appears in the bottom left hand corner of your little video image. And one of your options is rename. So I'm going to change this and add. Um, Alternatively, from the participant list, you can hover over your name, click more, and then one of your options is rename. So um, when you're working with your students, it's a good idea to ask them, you know, please rename yourself however you want me to call you. Um, if you can include pronunciation, if you think I might mispronounce it, you can include pronouns, you can make a silly name if that's what you prefer, okay? All right. So thank you all for being here. Um, I think we're just going to start um, by asking our, our um, speakers uh, to tell us about their observations, experiences, and advice with teaching coding. And we decided yesterday that Jerry would be first. Oh, we did. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, Doug suggested it and no one objected. So. All right. All right, um, sure. Uh, so uh, I've been teaching uh, programming at the university level for 20 years now, uh, and mostly all of it's been face-to-face. -face. Uh, we did develop a MOOC uh, that's on the Coursera platform, uh, I think it's five years ago now, that we did the one Java class. Uh, Jules and Doug have uh, much more experience in that than I do, uh, so I'm sure they'll give you a lot more advice in that realm. Uh, but you know, this last spring we had to go online. And so um, we, uh, luckily I had some prior experience doing that. So it, it, it didn't go, it went a little bit better than it could be expected. Um, so just some general advice is that when you're teaching coding, uh, you need to make sure, particularly online, you need to make sure that your code is visible. All right, uh, uh, you, if you try to pack, you know, uh, 40 lines, 30 lines, even 20 lines of code 
on a, on a single PowerPoint slide, uh, they just won't be visible to students who are viewing your video uh, on a smaller screen. So uh, it's very important to always make sure that your code is visible. So break it up. And if you're using PowerPoint slides, uh, uh, put only you know, 10, 15 lines on a single slide. And then have, if you have more, you, ha you have to run over to the next slide. Uh, that, that's clear. If you're actually doing live coding and, and videoing that, uh, so you're actually showing students your IDE, uh, may always make sure that you're in uh, what they call presentation mode, such that you're using a very large font uh, and, and your, your screen is zoomed in just to the code that you're writing uh, so that the code is easily visible uh, by the students. So that's, that's always key. You need to make sure that your uh, code is visible. Another thing that I learned from making that Coursera class is that you need to make sure that you're uh, to test your code before you commit it to video. Right? If, if you're doing a face-to-face -face lecture and you make a mistake on your PowerPoint slides, oh, you, go, oh, you, you point out, oh, I made this mistake, and, and you fix up the PowerPoint slides so that you, when you publish your PowerPoint slides after a lecture, it has the correction. Uh, but when you record a lecture and there's a mistake in it, uh, that's a little bit more, and that's hard to go back and actually edit the video or have to re-record it. So before you record uh, uh, coding, make sure your code is correct. All right, uh, that's... Uh, we made we made some mistakes in cor in that that first Coursera class that I did, uh, and that those mistakes are still in some of those videos five years later because it's just too much. I and mean, they're just small mistakes, but it's just too much effort to re-record those videos for those small mistakes. So uh, you always make sure that you test your code. Another thing that I do in face-to-face -face classes is I use a lot of visualizations. I'm always drawing diagrams on the whiteboard. Uh, and, and showing students, you know, this is what we're trying to accomplish. So we, do, we use a lot of visualizations. So when we go to online, all of a sudden now, I'm putting a lot of uh, diagrams and animations into my PowerPoint slides. Uh, and that's uh, very helpful for learning uh, before you actually get into the coding. You know, hey, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the other thing that we, you can do for uh, uh, online and, and recorded lectures is to use some type of tablet where you can draw and so you can just get a very clear uh, recording of your drawings. So visualizations are always very important for student understanding, in my mind, very important for student understanding. So to doing a visualization somehow, either animations in your PowerPoint slides or drawing on a tablet is also very useful. Um, one thing, so yeah, I, programming, I love programming. I, I really enjoy it and I really enjoy teaching it. Uh, and it really comes through in my face-to-face -face lectures, how much I enjoy doing what I do. Uh, and that's really hard to capture when you're recording a lecture. But I think it's really important that we try to do that when we record uh, uh, classes for future viewing, is to still have, show that enthusiasm that you have for the subject and, and to uh, and let the student somehow feel uh, that enthusiasm. Also, the final note that I have uh, that I wanted to share was that uh, when we, when I do things live in class, face to face, I make mistakes. Uh, and the students see those mistakes and we get to fix them up and discuss them. All right? When we record lectures, I already said, try to avoid mistakes. All right? So, uh, uh, but mistakes are so common in computer programming that it's good for students to see mistakes being made and then diagnosed, you know, find the source of that, that error, uh, that mistake, and then be able to fix it. So sometimes, I mean, so there's a great example, uh, Stuart Regis, who's a, a teaching faculty at University of Washington, uh, shared with a, a group of people about a year ago about uh, how he did a lecture, uh, and he's teaching to thousands of students at a time. He has 500 students in one auditorium. He has another 500 students in the auditorium next door that are just watching him on the screen. Uh, and he's doing this little demonstration and writing code, and it's all working perfectly. Then he goes, oh, hey, let's change this to, to do this now. And it sounds like it's such a simple change. And he changes this one condition, uh, it, but it leads to an infinite loop. And, and, and having the students see that uh, uh, error occur live, and then to see the professor step through the process of, of, of figuring out the error and then correcting it, it's very important for the students to see that demonstrated as well. Uh, otherwise, a lot of students, particularly in lower level classes, 
they think, oh, you know, every time we write code, it's always perfect. And that's never the case. <laughs> and so it's important for them to see a demonstration of uh, mistakes being made uh, and, and understand that that's a common thing uh, and then how to diagnose those, fix, find the uh, errors and correct them. All right, so I mean, those are the notes I made that I wanted to cover. Again, make sure everything's visible. Uh, make sure you test stuff so you don't make mistakes unless you, you plan in to do a mistake, all right? Um, and to use a lot of visualizations. So I mean, that's, 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 those are the notes that I had that I wanted to talk about today and for sharing on what I do for my online classes. Thank you, Jerry. That's great. Um, one, two things I would highlight there, that model of sort of the ways of thinking um, that we engage in is so powerful for students. So um, I'm usually not brave enough to, to um, plan in mistakes, but planning in a change in your code and, not, and perhaps doing it on the fly is a great idea. Um, and you're right, visualization is, is really powerful. So those resonate with me as someone who teaches something totally different. Um, Jules, would you like to share your sure. expertise? Yeah, so I've been uh, teaching online starting, I guess, in 2014. So initially doing Coursera courses, um, and then more recently we've developed an online master's program in computer science that I've developed several courses and taught online through for about the last year and a half. And then also I went through the transition from Coursera from a cohort model where my first class had 70,000 people enrolled in it um, to a, a more of a continuously rolling, people can go and take it at any time, and pass all the assignments. And then to the, the, the model that looks a lot like what we did on campus last spring where in the online masters it's been, they go and watch asynchronous material and then we have a synchronous session where we get together and discuss things. Um, so one of the things that I found most important in teaching coding, particularly teaching it online, is that coding is not something that you, you watch somebody present on a bunch of slides and then you're done, right? You don't, you don't, it's like painting or riding a bike. Somebody can describe all the theory to you, but at some point you have to actually go and try it in order to absorb it. And so one of the most important things I've found is the quality of the assignments and exercises that you give. Um, to force people to go out and, and um, code. And so I have found that in, in my doing the videos takes an, an immense amount of work. But once you've done that work, I mean, other than things like mistakes, like Jerry mentioned, which are really painful because you want to go fix it, but it's usually um, not the end of the world. The exercises and assignments are something that take a vast amount of work to maintain over time and also are something that the students probably get you know, the most, they invo they're involved with that more than probably your lecture. So they may watch your lecture for a week for an hour and then spend, you know, hours trying to code the assignment. And so that's, that's one of the things that, that I think is really important is having really high quality assignments and exercises that they can go and work independently on and make progress on. Um, the other thing I found with the assignments and exercises is that you inevitably you know, for Coursera, for example, for even the, the, the on-campus classes, you know, we are in a, a domain where everything is constantly changing underneath us. So the versions of Java, you know, the programming languages, the libraries, everything is continually changing. So you have to factor in a lot of work to keep everything up to date. And then, um, you know, I think one of the things that comes along with that is also just accepting that, you know, if you're teaching anything non-trivial, there's going to be a lot of work of everybody's going to have a different environment. Everybody's going to have issues and, and you know, testing things very, very thoroughly um, is really difficult and takes a lot of time to get it right. Um, now I just accept that when I put things out, somebody's going to have some configura strange configuration or something that's going to cause an issue um, and working through that. I learned a lot about this, uh, you know, Doug and I in some of the first Coursera assignments, you know, Doug said, when, before you put your first assignment out, you probably want to put it in the beta. And so put your assignment out of beta, and then you're going to have a thousand people tell you what's wrong with it. And then you can go in and figure out how to change the wording, change the, the, the technical requirements so that it can run on more machines and less issues. Um, and so I think just whenever you, you, you develop assignments, that's one of the most important pieces of a, a class where you're teaching. And, you know, 
um, realizing that there's going to be iteration and a lot of maintenance that goes into that. I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is um, sort of creating a culture within the students uh, and the expectation that they can go and figure things out themselves, that your lectures are not going to be um, everything they need to go and, and do in order to, you know, uh, uh, you know, gain full experience of that programming language or frameworks or things, that it's a starting point where you're going to give them a lot of the context and you're going to give them sort of the bare minimum, but they need to learn how to go and research things on them on their on their own or if they run into a strange exception that hasn't been mentioned that they can go and figure out what it means and what other people have done to solve it or what things you know might have gone wrong so i think that's a, a really important piece too is to set the expectation that you will go and use google to research things you will go find things on stack overflow to you know help you understand the obscure error you're getting um, you know but at the same time you know, I think you have to balance out not giving assignments where they can Google for the answer. So, you know, you want to give people assignments that are, that are, um, they have to go and, and do a lot of work on their own. They can't just Google for the answer, but they also are going to benefit a lot if they go and, and do research on their own and, and learn to help themselves. Um, so the worst thing I think is when you see students that are emailing you things that, they could have just taken the text of their email and piped it into Google and they would have gotten the answer as the first result. Like that's something I don't want to see because that tells me that they're not confident themselves going out and looking for um, challenges. And if you're a software engineer or you're doing any type of programming, everything's going to change. You're going to encounter this all the time. And one of the most important pieces is to be able to uh, retrain yourself. And then the last thing that I've seen that I think is really important, particularly with programming is helping students to understand that they need to get used to working on things iteratively and um, taking something from a known working state and making small changes and seeing what happens um, so that they don't end up, um, you know, when you see students that go off and write a lot of code, they don't compile it or they, they write a lot of code, but they never actually test it. I think really developing um, in, you know, making it clear that you need to make small changes, you need to make sure they work before you move on. And really, um, that students need to have a very iterative, you know, make a small change, run it, see what happens. And if you haven't done all three of those things, you shouldn't be moving on. You need to do that continuously and iteratively throughout. So I think that's one of the other really important things for teaching coding, particularly online, where they're not going to have um, consistent, you know, necessarily feedback from you. Maybe they're only seeing you once a week. Um, and there's not in-person office hours where they can just come and say, you know, I don't understand, my code's not working, and you work through a lot of these things, and they, they need to be more self-sufficient. Um, so I, I think those are some of the, the most important things that I've found when you're teaching coding online, at least, um, that need to be thought through. Yeah, thank you. Those are great. Um, about eight years ago, I heard a talk uh, by Barb Stengel, who's a professor at Peabody, who um, had this sort of catchphrase that she used, who's doing all the work, who's having all the fun. And her point was that like, we have fun when we solve intellectual problems, but that takes work. And so what we should always be thinking about doing is shifting the work to our students so they're having the fun of the intellectual discovery, but they're, they're learning. And so that's just everything you said, Jules, made me think about that, right? You're thinking about good assignments that help students do the work that they need to do and give them the confidence that they need to do to um, gain the skills you want for them. So thank you. Doug? Yes, ma'am. You are so. Uh, thank you. So I want to just say a couple things and then show you some examples of stuff by by sharing my screen, if that's okay. Uh, one of the things that you've probably seen if you you read books on how to be an effective uh, professional is the idea of getting a lot of practice. So for the past seven years or so, I've been doing continuous online courses, even when I don't need to, because I find it so much fun. And it's kind of a Malcolm Gladwell you know, 10,000 hours, you finally start to figure out what you're doing. So one thing I would encourage people to do is to get practice with this stuff, especially getting used to talking to a camera uh, and trying to show emotion, which is important. 
something else I'll, I'll come back to later is trying to make it so it looks as much as possible like you're you're talking to your class as opposed to being in a sort of ill-lit space. So I, I'll talk more about that in a second. But then I also wanted to talk about the need to give people the big picture. Uh, and so when I teach my classes on programming, I don't just show them code. I try to give them the bigger picture view of motivation, discussions of design, and so on. And I think that's a particularly important nowadays where we're not in the class where they could stop you and you draw some stuff on the board, you know, and make it sort of informal, but very effective. So thinking ahead of time about how to show more than just the code can be helpful. So let me just share my screen if that's okay for a second. So what I typically do is I have slides that I'll use to give people kind of the introduction to whatever it is we're going to look at with code. And so I, I try as much as possible to be highly visual in my slides. I try to make sure I leave breadcrumbs with links to other information so they can learn more about either the topics that are being discussed or finding the source code as we're seeing here. I try to visualize the code with other diagrams that illustrate more than just the logical flow through whatever programming language you use, class diagrams, interaction diagrams, and so on. And also try to give people sort of this right brain gestalt. If you're doing an image crawler or web crawler, as I'm showing here, we're crawling, we're showing a, a visualization of a crawler of some kind. And uh, so, so basically just trying to walk people through those kinds of things. The other thing I do is then when I actually present the code, which would come, of course, after, uh, after I'd shown the big picture view of the design, I try to leave breadcrumbs in the code as well. So sometimes you're teaching algorithms, sometimes you're teaching APIs. And wherever I'm teaching APIs, I try to put little links in the code. So if people come along and they're like, what was that thing? All they have to do is just click on the comments and boom, they're at the part of the documentation that explains how those various features work. And I find that's particularly helpful for students because they get more of a kind of a multimedia experience with the presentations of the material. Um, also going back to what Jerry was saying, so I'm a huge fan of getting it right in the final version. So when I do my classes live, which I, I tend to like to do live classes, from time to time I'll screw up. Uh, as Jerry said, that's inevitable. But what I do is before I create the final version, which I will upload to Brightspace or YouTube or whatever, I try to go back and, and I try to correct things so that the version that's on the web, that's really the one that they're likely to go back to if they, they need additional help is as corrected as possible. So what I thought would also be helpful, I put together a little web page that talks about the studio I have here in my house. And uh, I'll send the link out to the chat if anybody's curious about this. Um, and, and again, the, the point here is not everybody has to go over the deep end like I have with, uh, <laughs> with this stuff. But I found that especially as we're moving more and more to online things, students are comparing what we're doing with what their experience is if they go uh, you know, to, to YouTube and watch videos. And things are very, very exciting and interactive and well-produced. And so if our lectures, especially about something as potentially mundane and boring as coding, are boring, they're really going to react negatively. So I've set up a, a home studio with a whole bunch of cool stuff that was relatively inexpensive. You can read about it here. And then I have a little section here that talks about how I actually produce standalone videos from the material I record using my Zoom session. So I record everything with my HD webcam. And if you set the settings correctly, it'll be easy to export it and modify the, the result using your favorite editor like Camtasia or, or ScreenFlow. I then take the you know, hour and a half or whatever long lecture, put it into my editor, and then I chop it up into smaller chunks, typically five to 10 minutes in length. And then I take those chunks and I upload them to my YouTube channel. And I've got a YouTube channel that I've been using for quite a long time. And uh, this is basically where I put everything I do is up here so people can follow along. This is just my personal weirdness, but I like to have funky backgrounds that match my shirt color because it's interesting. Nobody ever seems to care about that except me, but that's okay. Um, but the point of all this stuff is that if you do this right, it's not that hard and it gives you a much better quality. And it also allows your students to go back and rewatch lightly edited versions of the content you presented that are hopefully corrected. And the other nice thing about that is if 
if you talk too fast, like I tend to do, or they don't show up for class one day, or they zone out during one of your lectures, they can go back and watch those lectures. And I find that particularly useful to help people when they come to me and, and ask kind of the questions I've gone over in lecture, rather than spending lots of time regurgitating that material, I just say, have you watched the videos I've uploaded? And inevitably they, they go off, they watch them, their questions are answered, or if they do have follow-up questions, they're a lot better prepared to ask them. So those are just some of the things I've found. Please feel free to you know, take a look at what I've got here. You could probably outfit your home studio for you know, several hundred bucks if you don't go off the deep end. And I think it makes a big difference in people's experience. And, and honestly, I think in many ways, a nice online video production is actually competitive with having people in class in front of you because it's really a lot more personal. Uh, you're looking at someone, they're looking at you. And uh, so, so it, I find if you do it right, it can be pretty, pretty uh, dynamic and energetic. All right, so I will stop sharing and pop out. Thank you so much. Um, that's some great advice from all three, Doug, Jerry, and Jules. Um, so what questions do you all have? You can unmute and ask your questions or you can put them in the chat and I will ask them in your stead. Totally up to you. Go ahead. I have a question. This is um, Stuart Weinberg. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I was, I was taking furious notes. Uh, I, um, I'm actually in the Department of Biomedical Informatics, uh, pediatrician by training, but goofy me majored in computer science uh, decades ago. And I've actually had the opportunity to teach programming uh, for several years actually here at Vanderbilt. Um, so a lot of what you uh, talked about um, uh, was very helpful and informative. You know, one of the bad experiences I've had, and, and I think this question might be for um, Jules, is, is sort of that balance between um, that balance in terms of telling students how much they can like cut and paste, <laughs> you know, from what they do find online. And um, I, in the past, I've, you know, tried to say, look, um, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone going to Stack Overflow to find some good solutions to things, but but you, you need to understand what they're doing and it can't be a shortcut to something that we're asking you to do. Um, and then people, uh, we had one unfortunate scenario where, where a couple of students were cut and pasting from each other and had the sense to change variable names, but the comments and indentation were identical. So they actually did a pretty poor job and, and, and that was a bit of a mess. So can you share with us your experiences on how to best approach that rather difficult line. <laughs> so are walk. you familiar with the tool called Moss by any chance? I have heard of it, but not so that's, familiar with it. Then. That's a really helpful tool. I, th I think Jerry's probably used it. I've used it in the past. It's basically a plagiarism checker tool for code. And it'll, it'll detect, you know, the things you describe, people changing the variable names and moving stuff around a little bit. And it's ex extremely automated, so you can basically just give them, you, know, you can take all the programming assignments and you can give like whatever skeleton or code you provided them, and it'll show things that are highly similar. So from a point of view of detecting it, that's a very nice tool. From the point of view of discouraging it, you know, that just has to be done through the same reinforcement techniques we use on little kids, right? You, <laughs> you're consistent in, in, in uh, giving them the rules and then, you know, giving the appropriate remediation if they violate those rules and reminding them over and over again and, and you know, turning it over to the honor council when you have to. <laughs> Jerry, you probably have a lot of experience with this based on the courses you, yeah. you teach. So, so in, for our Vanderbilt students, so if I'm teaching a class with Vanderbilt students, online or offline, uh, yeah, we use Moss to help uh, identify potential cheating and then we go in and verify, you know, look at the code and, and uh, the faculty, we have a small group that will uh, evaluate it and determine whether it's uh, justified to set, submit something to the honor council. Uh, so we, yeah, we, uh, there's a, the teaching faculty in this computer science were probably the honor council's biggest customers. Uh, we send students there uh, every semester. Uh, and, and so, and then we do a lot in our classes to discourage people. We remind them, we talk about a lot beginning of the class, beginning of the semester, I mean, 
uh, and then we remind them throughout the semester that you know if if they do cheat, uh, that they we will probably catch them and submit them to the honor council, and that the penalty is severe. Uh, and so we and we tell them that we you know we we love programming, we love teaching programming. Uh, we will bend over backwards to help you. Now, as far as my other like Coursera, uh, I don't bother with that at all. Okay, so I mean Coursera. Uh, if you go out there and Google, you're going to find solutions in GitHub and, and a lot of students just submit the same, you know, they're just interested in getting a certificate. So I, we have discussions on the forums and of course there are a lot with the students. Oh, I, I'm doing these peer evaluations. They're all the same code. I was going, oh, you can submit it to the help desk if you want. You can give them grade zero, but uh, I don't try to force that for Coursera courses. But for Vanderbilt courses, we, you know, we do have an honor council uh, and the students who come to the university make a pledge. To abide by the honor council rules or the honor code, and I think, uh, I, 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 yeah, and I've had to go to the honor council um, too. Not not a pleasant experience, um, and I think the Vanderbilt students, you, you know, probably get it that they shouldn't be stealing or cheating from each other. I, I think for some of our, especially since we're teaching grad students that may not be as familiar. Um, with like the use of a stack overflow, for instance, you, you know, where's the line there in terms of uh, of cutting and pasting, um, you know, what, what looks like a really great solution and, oh, yes, I can learn from that um, because I need to understand it or, or, or no, I, I, for me, that's, that's a, uh, like we had a exercise where we wanted uh, students to, to literally write a function to calculate um, uh, uh, dates in the future. It was a simple thing, but, you know, there are functions out there that just do that for you. And, and I said, well, that's not the point of the exercise. <laughs> the point of it is to really, you know, get into there and figure out like how they do that. You know, like what is, what is one month from January 31st and what assumptions do you need to make? Um, so, uh, um, I, I don't know, I've had struggles, uh, you, you know, kind of saying what, when it's okay to Google and use things from Stack Overflow and when it's not and under what kind of circumstances. So I, I personally try to do a lot of work in my assignment. Um, well, usually up front, what I say is if you take something, if you cut and paste as is um, from Stack Overflow, it needs to be, there needs to be a link to it in your code and a comment as a sort of a citation. So, you know, cop to the fact that you, you just went and Googled it and found the solution and put it in. And if you can find a solution to exactly what I'm asking you to do, and you can cite it properly and put it in there, I'm okay with that. Um, with the, and I, and I put it on myself, as I say, you know, my goal is not to cut you off. I mean, the, the truth is if somebody asked me to do something programming wise, and I can't immediately think of, of how I would do it, I'm going to go and, and search and look at it. And, and because I want to, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I also don't want to produce a solution that's inferior to what somebody else has done. And I can't imagine cutting that off for myself as a programmer because it's something so fundamental to what I do. So I, I, my personal per perspective is to, to give assignments where if they go and do that, that doesn't ruin the assignment. And it doesn't ruin that they, I think they still just got just as much out of it. Um, I think, I mean, I know there's different perspectives in different types of classes, but the types of classes that I've been, that I teach, I can get away with doing that and I can design the assignments in a way that either I know that they're not going to be able to Google for a solution or if they Google and find a solution, they're going to have to really understand it in order to adapt it to the context. And so I'm okay if they can go, you know, and find the algorithm and find exact code for the algorithm. But then when they bring it into the context of the assignment, you know, all of the types and um, other sort of assumptions are, are, are different enough that they're going to have to do work to adapt it. And so in that, in that process. So I think some of that goes into assignment and design. Now, it, you know, sometimes you just can't get away from that, that they could, you know, potentially Google it and maybe you don't want that. Um, and, and I think that's trickier. I tend to be lucky in that I don't have that aspect of my classes. But I think you can also have, if you have something like that, that you want to get people to do, um, you can think of it as like, I'm not going to give it as the graded thing. I'm going to give it as an exercise that they should go and work on. And I know that they will, you know, obtain, you know, they, they will learn that concept by trying to do this. If they don't do it, they're going to suffer for it later when I give them an assignment where they can't just go and cut and paste and they haven't really like 
grasped that concept because they took the shortcut and tried to like cut and paste. And so I, sometimes I'll take that approach where I'll give an exercise where there's lots of stuff that you could go and find and do, but you know, if you do it and you put effort into it, it will really help you, you know, later down the road when we do something where um, there aren't all of the easy outs. Um, so I think, I think it's, I think there, I think there's a lot of it goes into, you know, the type, I mean, I, my classes and that I'm teaching, I think I can get away with designing my, ex, my assignments in a way that I, that I can, um, either it's okay, or they're going to have to do so much work. I'm all right with it. Mm -hmm. Stuart, thanks for the, wonder, thanks for the discussion. I appreciate it. Yeah. I wonder whether in a case like that, where they could Google the solution, whether you could say you have two options, you can either write your own, version or you can google it but if you google it you also have to answer these additional questions like what assumptions were inherent in the code um what was the purpose of i don't know line this line that line that line um so that they're still having to do the thinking that you want them to do in either version of the assignment that they they use. Yeah. So, uh, I know Tom wanted to ask something. I'm hoping that you're asking your question about breakout rooms, but you may be asking a different one. Um, yeah, I mean that, that ba basically that combined with a broader question of if you're doing kind of planning to do synchronous teaching, so you can have students do things online, but then uh, I'm expecting my students will, for the most part, be coming to class as usual. It'll just be all online at the usual time and kind of how folks either from what they've done in the spring or what they plan to do in the fall plan to use that class time how much will be spent uh, with lecturing on material how much will be spent uh, doing assignments in class whether you'll you know give code ahead of time that you'll expect students to have have downloaded and bring to class and maybe have them work on on problems during class and breakout rooms and just other kinds of strategies that people have either used in the past or thought about in the context of not a fully online like Coursera course, but one where you're planning to use the online time most productively. And from my perspective, I also want to be doing something that will carry over to hopefully the spring when we're not under COVID or maybe next year when we're not under COVID, not something that's just purely designed for this, for this fall. So um, when I've done you know, for Zoom classes, I've done a variety of things. I've used, um, so for breakout rooms were mentioned at the beginning. So I've used breakout rooms for a bunch of different things. So one thing that I think breakout rooms work really well for is if you have students do exercises or assignments beforehand that are due before class, and then you use breakout rooms for them to go and evaluate and peer code review um, other people's assignments. That goes really well. Um, so when I've done that, you know, every single group has a lot to say about the assignments. Either they, they, they come out saying, wow, this is so much better than what I did and I didn't think through the solution and you can tell that they got a lot out of looking at it or they have a lot of, you know, really specific details about, you know, things that should be changed and, and the person that they're reviewing get a lot, gets a lot out of it. So I've seen a lot of, you know, whenever I've done breakout rooms of code reviews, you know, when I drop into the breakout rooms to see how it's going and I'm popping in and out of those rooms, there's lots of active and engaged discussion. Um, when I've, you know, in in-person classes, you know, I'll do a lot of like in-class exercises where they're coding things. And I find that it, for me personally, that has not worked well in, you know, Zoom or that because one, usually the, the it's hard to have people do something really sophisticated coding wise. Um, in a breakout room. And so when, I, when I've done that, what my experience is, is you go into the breakout room and the one person who's the best coder is sitting there with their screen shared and they're typing in the solution. Everybody else is kind of watching them. Um, and you, you end up, what I've seen is the model ends up being that one person does all of the work. And um, it also takes so much more time for them to produce solutions that it's hard to do anything. Uh, the other things I've used that I've used my class time that I uh, for that are, are not just lecturing that work really well is one is I in now all of my classes because I've done it twice now just worked really well is to force everybody to submit 
um, a minimum number of questions on the material um, beforehand. And so the, the, usually what I'll do is 24 hours before class, they're required to have watched all the asynchronous content or read whatever it is or looked at the assignment and then to submit, you know, three to five, you know, like intelligent questions that they're going to be graded on. Um, like if you submit garbage, you're, you're not going to get a good grade on it. If you submit reasonable questions, um, you get a decent grade. Uh, you know, you're going to get an A. So it's, it's basically an easy A for them on a weekly basis. They have to submit the questions beforehand. And then what I'll see is I'll see themes come up in the questions of what people are confused about from the asynchronous or outside material. And then I can use that to dedicate class time to going through examples in the code where I'll walk them through something or walk through them or walk through an architectural concept. And I find that really works really well. And it also makes my life a lot easier because, you know, they're off somewhere totally disconnected from me and I'm not sitting with them in office hours kind of understanding where they're lost. And so, you know, before class, I already know kind of a good idea of the things that people are missing or their common themes and what people are having trouble with. And then I can dedicate a lot of time to it. It makes my prep easier. Um, and I, you know, I, I spend, time just thinking about what are good examples of that and how to talk through it. And usually then that also engages students in, you know, a lot of times with the big Zoom class, mm -hmm. people realize they can disappear, mute themselves, and, you know, they look like they're staring at the screen even if they're doing something completely different. Um, but then if you start reading a question that they produ produce, then they tend to get more engaged. So those are some of the things that I found work well in class, like code reviews and breakout rooms, making them submit questions beforehand, um, you know, sometimes I've gone through and done like walkthroughs of code and I'll randomly call on people just like I would in class, but that, you know, it's usually, there's a lot of overhead of people coming off mute and then answering and then going back on mute. And so sometimes that becomes clunky when I've done that. I follow up with just a logistical question of how large a breakout room when you're having students work on kind of sharing code is, is a reasonable size. What's too small? What's too large? So I, I, I think it, if it's code reviews, I think three is a pretty nice size. Um, if it's producing code, I think smaller is better. So maxing out at like two is probably better because then you have more people in the class actually doing work um, and typing things in. And I think they get more engaged if there's just two people in the room. Um, um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so, Bobby, do you want to ask those or do you want me to read them out? No, I'm happy to ask. Um, so, um, yeah, so my questions are, um, so in the online setting, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how you get them up to speed on the tools that they're using. Um, uh, you know, everybody's going to have problems with their tools and how do you get the class on the same page with whatever compilers or debuggers or IDEs that they're using. Uh, so that's a initialization question. And then the second question is how, how are you teaching and how are you handling debugging in a completely online environment. So the traditional way that I do debugging is, of course, office hours, sit down one on one or do do a you know recitation session where we sit down and, and do like a code review code walkthrough like Jules was just talking about. How do you handle those? What are best practices? So this is one thing I think where the online model really serves us well because uh, once you start doing this one time for one person, you can record it and then go back and either edit that or or you know get inspired by what you said in the recording and make a new recording. So if you want to teach people, for example, how to use Git or how to use C Lion or IntelliJ or whatever your favorite tool is, um, what I would probably recommend doing is either pre-record those things so that you could then give them out to the class or use a forcing function like office hours where you give a little tutorial and record them for whoever shows up and then uh, go ahead and, and post that to your, your Brightspace page or YouTube or wherever you put your videos. And I'm hoping over time that one of the things we can do as a department and maybe broader for other people on campus is start recording these kinds of things because you know there's no need for each class to reteach Git, for example. There's no need for each class to reteach C Lion or IntelliJ or whatever it is. Um, 
And so someone, whoever's the first person to do it could do that. And then we could build a little library and reuse those kinds of things. I've also found it useful to have my grad students do the same kind of thing, uh, record little snippets of stuff that they find themselves giving the students over and over again. And that way they can, they can um, you know, reuse it. The other thing I do, and that's my idiosyncrasy, I give everybody comments on their programming assignments when they turn them in. And then I create a video, which is my frequently made mistakes video, where I walk through all the mistakes I see. I don't really tell them what the answers are. I just say, here are the common mistakes, and I give them a hint about the answer. And then I post those also on my Brightspace or YouTube channel. And that's really valuable to get people to kind of see what other people are doing. You, you do it one time. You don't have to keep redoing it for every student in office hours. So it's just a way to be a productivity multiplier. So those are some of the things I do. Okay. Yeah, I, I would add to that just the, you know, I think like if you see it, um, if you see it in office hours, then you can bring it in as a, you know, if you want to take some time and cover it in a live session, like you could take somebody's, um, turn it into an example that you discuss with people and what, what was sort of the flawed thinking and how to go through it. I, I found that that works well as, sometimes too. Okay, great. All right, so I guess a follow-up to that, uh, Jesse, is the DSI still going to come through with Git videos for us? Yes, it is. It is, as a matter of fact, I'm working on them right now. So, okay. uh, but actually, this conversation is giving me some some good ideas. Uh, you know, for uh, you know, for example, uh, using animation. It just didn't occur to me before, but that's such a natural way to get across. So yes, and I'm working on those this week. We'll have them. Uh, we'll have them by mid or late next week. Yeah. Awesome. So this is a point that someone made earlier about having to deal with students in, in kind of navigating different environments. So you know, when I teach computational neuroscience, trying to get Keras and TensorFlow set up on a Linux machine or a Windows machine or a Mac, and people have different versions of Macs. And one of the things that hmm. one of my colleagues suggested that he had done um, this past spring, and I just was wondering if others have done something like this, is um, he used Piazza as a platform for getting students to ask questions about, about you know, how can I do this in PyCharm? And if, you know, if they can't Google it and they don't see a direct answer, or anyone else have any trouble getting something set up in Keras? Um, and I wonder if, if anyone's used those kinds of platforms. And I was thinking of possibly, if I do it, kind of encouraging students to help answer students' questions on that yeah. platform and give... Uh, you know, kind of extra credit if I see someone's a good citizen and helping others navigate that might not have the, you know, especially in neuroscience and psychology, we have a wide range of technical expertise of being able to get things set up. Piazza is great. I use it all the time. It's real simple. It does exactly what you said, Tom. It encourages other yeah. people to jump in. Um, and then it also provides a way for if I answer a question one time, the next time someone asks a question, I post a link to my answer <laughs> rather than reiterate it. And I tell people, you know, if you have a question, please go and search to see what's there. So I find it, again, you know, tremendous productivity multiplier and my TAs can jump in. I think especially with classes where you have graders or TAs who've done this before, which we do a lot in computing, that's a, a wonderful resource. It's like a knowledge garden that you can, you can uh, seed and water that will pay dividends as it grows and blooms. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Piazza. Yeah, I'm, I, I love Piazza. I'm, I think I might have been the first uh, user at Vanderbilt. And in fact, I just heard from them this last week saying, you know, hey, do you have any suggestions? And so one thing that I did suggest to them is, would be the ability to actually do a video response and record a video response and that way, and do a screen capture. That way, that way again, when the students ask this question, they go, oh, here, this is how you do this and, and do it on a little video. And so we'll see if, if that comes through their platform. That will be a great improvement. But Piazza, uh, I mean, when I started using Piazza, I don't know how many years ago I started using that, I made it cut down the amount of email I was handling uh, tremendously. So because do you set up a brand new one for each class or do you have one for a particular class and students can go back and see the last several years of comments and questions or is it I, fresh I, I for each class? I create a new okay. session each semester. I create okay. a new Piazza class for each yep, class. Yep, so yep, there's yep. different students, different questions. And, and uh, I, I actually deactivate uh, the old ones so that students, students who are in, who use, who were in that class can go back and look at the answers, but they really can't post new questions. Uh, but so yeah. we use we use Slack instead of Piazza. What would be yeah. the advantage in your mind over Piazza over Slack? Yeah. Great question. I'm not familiar with Slack, so I can't answer that. Anyone else? I have a more basic question. So 
I know people love Piazza. It sounds to me the same as a discussion board on Brightspace. What makes it better? Like I know how Slack differs from the Brightspace discussion board, but I don't know about Piazza. Well, so for those of us who've been around here for a while, Vanderbilt keeps changing the learning management system. So I try to keep as few things in the learning management system as possible because number one, it keeps changing. Over this time, is not it, true. It, it, it is true. It is true. One time, <laughs> Oak is the same thing as Blackboard, yeah, but, and then we but, changed to Brightspace. But, we, one but change. we also teach. We also teach in other platforms too. So our two U okay. platform is different, and the Coursera platform is different, and the Coursera platform changed it over and over again. So after having been burned repeatedly, moving things around between like five different platforms since I've been at Vanderbilt. I try to put as much stuff as possible in things that are fairly stable and outside the reach of any decision that's made without my control. So that, that's kind of one aspect. Um, I also, I can't stand, this is just my personal thing. I, I have a hard time with Brightspace. I find it very clunky and non-intuitive, but that's, that's probably just because I don't know it well enough. But it's, it's, it always finds a way to thwart me, uh, whereas these other <laughs> things are really set up to be easy to use. So is but, that you know, the fundamental I, I, difference I, I, between Piazza and the Brightspace discussion board is that it's just, it's a, a little bit easier to, to use fewer clicks? Better design I, I, from what I've heard. Yeah, like clunky is the, is the best description, I think, of, of Brightspace <laughs> versus Piazza. So it's like modern, like an application that's written like you would expect a modern web application to be written versus something that feels very old and dated. I, I, and, and, and Piazza is, is very uh, customizable. I mean, I have mine set up such that I receive a digest of posts uh, every, you know, after two hours. So when a student posts a new question, I don't see that right away. And hopefully by the time I actually go look at it, someone else has already answered it. <laughs> That's the key. Hopefully someone else has already answered the question uh, so that I don't have to. Uh, but it, I, 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 I'm a huge fan of Piazza, and if you if you haven't tried it, you should. If you contact me offline, if you'd like anybody about Piazza, I I, I really uh, have used it for years and really like it as a discussion. It, it, it it's students can edit other students' questions and answers, mm -hmm. and it's it's uh, one of those things that's very flexible, uh, and students get a lot of questions and answers right away. And again, that like Doug said, I, I have my students. Hey, search. You know, when they post a question and it's a duplicate, I go, hey, come on, this has already been answered. Do a search. And so I teach them how to do search Piazza and they I, find we, their answers. We use Slack quite a bit in other contexts. I find Slack to be lacking when it comes to like question kind of response, question having threads. The threads mm -hmm. get put in a different thing and it just, it's, it, it just, it seems, Slack just seems to not be designed very well to, to have like question followed by a bunch of responses and, and I know it, I know you can do that, but it's just not, it does, it's not as intuitive from what I've done playing around with Piazza. So I have another question that sort of follows up on that. Um, I'm in astronomy and I teach a grad class that ends up being a lot of coding and data management. And when the students meet in person, they work together a lot and they help each other and they talk about solutions. So besides um, Piazza, do you have other tools that you use to try to foster that kind of work among the students? Or do you have any tips about how you get them to do that when it's online and it's not in person? So I know in the online master's program, at least, the, there's a Slack channel or there's a, a Slack or I forget what it's called, organization or whatever it is um, for the online master's. And so they connect there with other people that are in the class and then they will um, I know that they connect over Slack um, and and work on things together. Um, we do all the you know all of the assignments go out through GitHub Classroom, so they've already got repositories where they can all commit remotely and coordinate. Um, and so, I mean, between those two things, I think that drives a lot of coordination. I don't know if they Zoom or call each other on the phone or do other things like that. Um, I don't think I haven't had it. I haven't given any group projects in um but i know that they are interacting because i can you know they'll you know say oh well like i was we were talking about this on slack and you know you know such and such came up so i know that i think they do you know some of those things my undergrads i find you know on campus they've always used group me and or they'll have or they'll do something else um 
group me is the one that I hear my undergrads use a lot or Slack. And so I think they'll connect with each other on those things. Um, the other thing I think that's helpful is to, um, particularly if you're giving some of the lectures asynchronously, then dedicate some of the class time to say, okay, we're going to break you up into breakout rooms for your groups and you do whatever you're going to do, but you've got, you know, an hour to coordinate and do something. Um, and I know you're all free right now. And that also you know, gets people to do things. Yeah. And that mirrors what I was going to say. So um, Jules, master students already know each other, have, have a situation where they want to work together. But with our undergrads, I think, um, it's particularly if they're, freshmen or sophomores, we're going to need to encourage that more. And so this time, taking time in class to say, hey, get in these groups and work together, whether you're working on a formal project or informal project, I think it's going to be really helpful. I also, whenever I break them up into groups to do something, I always make sure that whatever I'm having them do is something that has to be turned in and at least have the perception that it's going to get a grade. Mm -hmm. And that motivates everybody to engage and do something. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we are at 1258. Um, so I'm going to draw us to a close. Um, Doug, if you if your bandwidth will let you if you could turn your video back on so I can thank you um, like face to face. <laughs> I really appreciate um, you all Jerry Jules and Doug. Um, being here sharing your expertise today. Um, I appreciate the rest of you all being here asking your really good questions, sharing your good ideas. Um, I will post this recording um, on that page where you are registered and I will send you a link to that along with a link to the page that Doug shared with us um, about his online recording studio and just the link to Piazza. Um, so thank you. Appreciate you being here. Um, and I loved getting to hear about your all's approaches um, to teaching these classes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Bye. Very yeah, nice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>